What up, 6 p.m.? If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open it up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. As uh, Gabe just mentioned, we are launching a brand new series called Jesus Changes Everything. And I love that because it's so true. Jesus doesn't want to just change some things in your life. We serve a God that wants to change everything everything in our lives and so it doesn't matter what situation you're in God has a changing power within him and so for the next few weeks we're going to unpack really what does that look like for you and I what does that actually mean if Jesus really changes everything how does that relate to me in my life and so 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 16 to give you some context uh, of the scripture that we're going to be unpacking here tonight the apostle Paul is uh, writing a letter to the church in Corinth and 2 Corinthians is his second letter to this church in Corinth. And he's uh, writing them a letter to address certain issues that were popping up in the church. And uh, at this time, uh, the, this church in Corinth, they were uh, being known for showing favoritism to people based on their status and credentials. And so they were giving special preferences to people and so forth. And it reminded me of a time when we had a pretty well-known local celebrity who's kind of well-known international came to our service and everyone was just fangirling. In fact, most of our leadership team was taking a picture with this person after service. And so I'm like, guys, what the heck are we doing? Let's treat everyone the same. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes we can get so caught up with the appeal of a person and we can begin to show favoritism to people. So Apostle Paul addressing this issue reminds the church of who they are in Christ. You're not like the world. So don't act like the world. Let's act out our brand new identity in him. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this is what he writes to them. He says this, at one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. I love that because before Christ, many of us had wrong perceptions of who God is and really what he's about. And once you come into a relationship with God, he changes that mindset of who he is. He begins to transform our perception of, of how amazing this God we serve is. And so he literally gives us a different point of view on how we can view him in our lives. Verse 17, he says this. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Come on, somebody. How many of us are so thankful for our brand new life that we have in Christ? The old is gone. The new has begun. Verse 18, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling or reconnecting the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation where now we become messengers of God to reconnect them back to him. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God, that is our message, calling people back into a relationship with God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So much gems in this brief passage of scripture that we're going to unpack tonight to talk about how Jesus changes our past. So join with me as we pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. God, I pray that your truth will bring transformation starting from the inside and making its way to the outside. God, we thank you that one word from you can radically change our life and the trajectory of where we're currently heading. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to us in a real and tangible way. So we posture ourselves to hear from you. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that is soft, open, and receptive for everything that you want to deposit into us tonight. Let this seed reap a harvest, and a harvest that produces a harvest that makes an impact not only in our lives, but the people around us. We thank you for who you are. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen and amen. The title of my message tonight is this. Say goodbye to the old me. Ooh, that's a good title. Say goodbye to the old me. Man, that'll preach. And if there's anything that you would remember from my message tonight, remember the title. Say goodbye to the old me. In fact, do this. Turn to your neighbor and tell him this. Say goodbye to the old me. Say goodbye to the old me. 
We're in process. God is changing us. Every day is a transformation process in Christ. So say goodbye to the old me. Uh, I'm a DIY fanatic. I don't like doing things myself, but I like to watch people do things, okay? I don't have the skills to do things on my own, but I really admire people who have not only the creativity to do stuff on their own, but they also have the skill and the determination to finish projects. How many of us have a ton of unfinished projects around your house? Let's just be honest. All right, sometimes you, you start something and then you realize when you're starting it, man, I don't know if I should have done this. So I like watching shows like Joanna Gaines and Chip Gaines, you know, I, I, I like these HGTV stuff because it inspires me to do stuff that I wouldn't necessarily do. And you know what I do? I try to find people who can do the stuff for me. I resource because I don't want to get myself in stressful situations. And so I like to watch renovations, home renovations. Those are cool things. HGTV, I, mean, I like watching that kind of stuff. And then I stumbled on some home improvement fails online, okay, where people had great ideas that didn't necessarily turn out well. And maybe this will relate to you in some capacity, but I have some pictures of some fails of people who are trying to do it themselves. When DIY goes wrong. Put up the first picture. This is when eyeballing goes wrong. Nah, just eyeball him. Nah, yeah, look, look straight. <laughs> straight. Yeah, bugger straight. And then what straight eventually comes is very crooked. Very, very crooked. DIY go wrong. Before we show the next picture, I got to set it up because, you know, sometimes when you're purchasing a home, they say there's a one and a half bath. This next picture literally shows you what the half looks like. Put up that next picture. This is a half <laughs> bathroom. I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know what was happening. I don't even know what was going on in their mind. But they literally said, that's a half bath. Let's make a half bath for someone, okay? I don't know what was happening here, but this is a messy situation. That's unusable. Speaking of toilets, there's another toilet situation. This is where, like, you are, uh, you be creative because you don't want to go buy new stuff, so you want to make use of what you currently have. Put up the next picture. <coughs> Instead of, you know, fixing everything, let's just cut around the door. Let's make that thing work, right? Not knowing that when you close it, you can see everything, right? Let's just make use of what we currently have when DIY goes wrong. Uh, before we show up the, the last picture, uh, one of the things that um, I did before leaving my old place is we installed new ceiling fans, and this literally is a ceiling fan. Take a look at this DIY project. Put that last picture up. That's literally <laughs> a ceiling fan. They took a fan, put that bad boy on the ceiling. Instant ceiling fan. <laughs> Crazy. Now, I hope you're just thinking about some of the projects that you've done in your house where you kind of makeshift Jimmy Rig stuff together to try and put that stuff together. But I don't know about you. Looking at this just reminds me and helps me to be more thankful that we don't serve a God that does DIY fails. Come on, somebody. We don't, does, we don't serve a God that just tries to make things work, make it fit, eyeball our lives. We serve a God that not only wants to uh, renovate our lives. In fact, God takes it a step further. He doesn't want to renovate your life. He wants to give you a brand new life. It's not about an upgrade when it comes to God. It's about giving us a brand new life, a brand new identity, and a brand new life of meaning and purpose. That's what our God wants to do. And in this renovation process that God does, you know what you and I often think about when it comes to this process? We think God just wants to rearrange things in our life. Maybe take this couch and move it this way, or maybe move this table that way. God doesn't want to just rearrange stuff in, in our lives. He wants to do a complete demolition and deconstruction. Why? Because the life that you and I have currently built up is probably built on a wrong foundation. And if the foundation is faulty, you know what's eventually going to happen? Whatever you built is eventually going to come tumbling down. So you know what our God does? He loves us so much. He knows that if we keep living our life that way, that, that eventual fall is going to happen. So he does the deconstruction from the get-go. 
And that's the process that you and I don't like. When God starts to tear some things down in our lives. But I want to remind you that in the tearing, it's just preparation for the new life that God wants to give us. So be encouraged and endure the seasons where things feel like, what are you doing, God? Why are you doing this? Because there's a better process and a better person that God is creating you and I to be. So let us all trust the process. And so in this passage of scripture that we just read, we're going to pull out four ways that God wants to give us a brand new identity in him so that we can say goodbye to the old me. First point in our notes is this. In Christ, our past is erased and we are made new. Our past is erased and we are made brand new. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. John 3 talks about this idea and a phrase that maybe you've heard relating to church. is this idea of being born again. Where we have a new birth. When we come into a relationship with God, we experience a spiritual rebirth. Our new self in Christ becomes alive. And there's spiritual transformation that begins on the inside. And our identity now is based on the work of Christ, what he's doing in our lives. We have a new birth, and so our identity is related to that new birth. We are no longer who we once were. The old life has gone. Literally means this. The old person, your old self, is dead. D-E-A-D. That person is dead. Make die dead. We don't have to <laughs> resurrect that person because our old self has literally died. And in that process of that death happening, God gives us a new life, a new identity. And we, you and I, are now called and commissioned by God to live out our new identity in him. The best uh, physical example that helps us to illustrate really what this process is, is when a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. They call this a metamorphosis, where a caterpillar goes through a transformational process that happens over 9 to 14 days. And at the end of the 14 days, you literally have a butterfly. I went to a drive through baby birthday party, and the theme was butterflies. And they were literally giving out people cocoons that would eventually turn into a butterfly. I thought that was pretty interesting and weird all at once. But this idea of us becoming a new person is literally the same process that a caterpillar, caterpillar goes through in becoming a butterfly. What has to happen before the butterfly is birth? The caterpillar has to what? Die. The, the caterpillar literally has to die. And through that death, there's a transformation that takes place. And over the course of time, a new birth, a new identity, and literally a new creature emerges. It will be weird if the butterfly that's birthed out of it begins to go back to try and resurrect the caterpillar. It will be weird to try and put on caterpillar, you know, parts onto a butterfly body. And so what God is communicating to you and us is, you and I is this, that you are a new creation. You are a new person. Don't go picking up that old self. That person has died, literally has been buried in Christ. So you and I need to what? Flap our wings spiritually to become the butterfly that God has created us to be. And so if we are a new creation, God is wanting to remind us to live out your new identity. Leave the past in the past. When it comes to our lives, the Bible talks about how God forgets our past, which is kind of weird because if God is all-knowing, how can he forget? He literally knows everything. So when it comes to God, is he that forgetful like, ah, oh, I forgot my keys? No, he's not like that. When God, and the Bible describes God as a forgetting our sins, what that literally means is this. He knows our past, but he's choosing to forget it. He's making a conscious choice to do two things. Forget our past and also not to hold our past against us in a relationship with him. Oh, come on. That's really good. Come on, somebody. That's good. He's not only being forgetful of our past, but he's choosing not to use our past against us. Because sometimes in relationships with people, they use our what? 
our past against us. God doesn't relate to us in that capacity. He's choosing to forget our past, and he's also making a decision not to bring our past back up in relationships with him. So if God forgets our past, what is that describing us to do in our relationship with him? We got to forget it too. We have to make a conscious effort in our lives to move forward and to embrace this new identity in him. It's a choice that we have to make. We're not going to feel our way forward. We're going to have to make a decision by faith to see ourselves in a way that God sees us in our lives. And when God looks at us, you know what he sees? He sees the finished work on the cross through Jesus Christ. When the Bible says that we're covered by his blood, literally what that means is when God looks at us, he sees what Christ did on the cross. What did Christ do on the cross? Died for our sins. And then when he resurrected, he conquered sin and death. So now when God looks at us, he sees us through the lens of his son. So don't be living in the past. Let's move forward into God's preferred future and let's walk out our new identity in him. Second point is this. Our new life is a grace gift we receive from God. It's a grace gift. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself. This new life is a gift. And what do you do with a gift? You don't earn a gift. You just receive receive a gift. If someone's going to give you a gift, the worst thing that you can try to do is try to earn that gift back or try to do something to make that gift, make you feel worthy of receiving that gift. All you do with a gift is just simply receive it. And by faith, through grace, that's what we do. When God gives us this new life, we receive it by faith. And here's the truth. None of us could make our lives new on our own. There's nothing that you and I could do on our own strength to manufacture a brand new life. In fact, our attempts to try and start off a new life led to more failures and disappointments. How many of us have New Year's resolutions that you gave up the second day in January and that dis discouraged you and helped remind you that I'm not good at making myself new? Because we don't have the capacity to do that on our own strength. So we don't earn it. We receive it. The gift for us is free, but it costs God everything. What did it cost God? It cost God having to sacrifice his one and only son to pay the penalty of our sins. So Jesus literally takes our place. And through his death and resurrection, Jesus restores us back to God when we put our faith in him. So it's free for us to receive, but it cost him everything. And so for people who want to use this forgiveness from God as a license to sin, you don't understand what it costs God for you and I to receive this free gift. It cost him his life. So what do we do in response to a sacrificial God who gave literally himself for us? We live a life of surrender. Saying, not my will, but yours, God. I'm not going to try to do my own way live out my own purpose, now I submit to what you have for me in my life. It's your will, not mine. That's what a life of surrender really looks like. And so our best response to this generous gift from God is to live our, hands, our lives with our open hand and an open heart. God, whatever you want for me, I'm, I'm down. I tried to build my life on my own, and I realized I can't. So now I submit to you, the master architect of my life, and I trust your plans and purpose for me. I submit to that. So our new life is a grace gift we receive from God. Third point is this. Stop living based on the past. We need to stop living based on the past. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to him, no longer counting people's sins against them. So God was in the world, uh, working through Christ in the world, reconciling or reconnecting us back to God. And so God is no longer holding our past and our sins against us anymore. So if God has moved past our past, we need to move past that as well. So we need to start taking some practical steps to move forward in faith. Uh, I brought with me a rearview mirror. I have this on my car and I attach it to my window. On my, my rearview mirror because it's a Broadway mirror. It helps you see things wider. The older you get, you really realize how limited 
your vision can be sometimes. And so this is really a blessing. And what a rear view mirror is supposed to do is to give us perspective on the past. And some of us, we use the rearview mirror to do makeup. I don't know, women, how you do that? How do you put on makeup and drive at the same time? That is crazy. But anyways, it's another message in itself. But we don't drive forward staring at the rearview mirror. None of us do that, right? We're not over here staring at the rearview mirror. It's just there to give us perspective on where we came from. But we're not driving forward looking at this. But spiritually, sometimes that's how we live our lives. We're more focused on what is in the past, and we're barely paying attention to the future. In fact, some of us are so consumed with the past, you know what happens? We have this negative self-fulfilling prophecy where we're so fixated on what was done to us or the failures and the disappointments that you and I went through. You know what begins to happen? We're so focused on that, we begin to manifest that into our future, meaning this, you're beginning to look, so if you were disappointed in your life, you're beginning to look for disappointment in your life to reinforce that belief that life is always going to be disappointing. So it's this negative self-fulfilling prophecy. Why? Because your perspective is wrong. You're focusing on the wrong thing. So what God wants to do in our lives is this, simply get our eyes off the rearview mirror into the windshield of our future. The more you get into the word of God, the more you see what he has for you in your life. But if you're not reading anything and you're not looking forward to anything, all you're left with is the past. So when God says he wants to give you a new future, he wants you to unpack what that looks like. So getting into the word, getting around God's people is practical ways that we can to get a glimpse of what God wants to do in our lives. So our perspective is wrong. I love it because it's just literally this. It's just three or four inches down. That's all we need. And when we're focused on this, and you know what happens? The further we're trusting God with our future in faith, the things that were huge in our lives before get smaller and smaller. They have this thing on the, the, the mirror says this. Objects appear closer. What? Then, uh, uh, objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. Why did they become uh, appear closer? Because you're just staring at it for so long. That's what happens with our practical lives, that things that happened years ago, because we're so consumed with it, feels like yesterday. So what God wants us to do is fix our focus on our future and begin to trust him, get into the word, get around his people so that they can reveal to us what he wants to do in our lives. Ephesians 4 takes it a step further and it says this, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, verse 22, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. I love this because truth isn't just this abstract idea. Truth is personal. In fact, truth is a person and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So the more we know Jesus, the more we understand what truth is really about. And we, can, we need to get rid of everything and anything that keeps us tethered to our past. So that's the decision that you and I have to make. Now that we have a new, ide new identity in God, everything and everyone that ties us to that old identity, you know what we have to do? We have to disconnect and de-tether ourselves from those things. So some of us need to do a spiritual cleaning in our lives. We need to get rid of some old stuff. We need to get rid of some old relationships. Some of us today would have to go home, start deleting people. Not because you love them or you don't love them. You just know that your connection to them in this current season will not allow you to experience what God has for you. So you're going to have to start having some necessary endings. Why? Because that old person is dead. So when they start to text you, like, new phone, who this? Because I don't know you anymore. This is a new person. And so we literally are going to have to do a spiritual cleaning, spring cleaning, like literally get rid of all the old stuff that tethers us to our old lifestyle. Next example is, I don't need to even say this, but we all know what happened uh, last Sunday. I think it was happening as I was preaching last Sunday night, but it was the slap that was heard around the world, okay, uh, literally, uh, Will Smith 
and uh, Chris Rock got into it. And I don't need to give you details about what happened. Let's just say this, that both of them were wrong. Chris shouldn't have said that about Jada and Will shouldn't have done that, going up there and physically assaulting someone. So literally there was wrong that goes across the board. And before we start being judgmental, I don't know about you, I'm just glad that our lives aren't on national television. Because if we're honest, you and I have had Will and Chris Rock moments in our lives. There just wasn't a phone there to capture it. <laughs> so praise God for the grace of God that doesn't broadcast our lives to the whole world for everyone to crit critique and be critical about. So before we become judgmental, let's just realize that you've had, you and I have had moments like that where our lifestyle didn't match the Lord that we serve. And so what, what literally happened is there, there was a slap and so forth. And so I want to play this tape forward. If this was a situation that you and I were in, how do we apply this truth about what we're talking about to this current situation? So first thing that Will would have to do is really repent. Ask God for forgiveness about his action. And he actually did a public apology. And he talked about how what he did was wrong and how he is a work in process in progress, and I don't know if it was he that wrote that or if it was his publicist. Either way, only God really knows how genuine this apology is. And like we learned about last week, the fruit of repentance is seen in what happens after what hap uh, the situation. And so if he goes to God and repents, God, forgive me for what I did. God, I want a brand new start. I I'm remorseful for what happened, and I, I ask you for forgiveness. What God really does is this. He forgives him. He forgives Will what happened, and he also begins to forget what just happened. So that's the relationship that Will has with God, but how is the relationship that Will has with us? We haven't forgotten, right? Many people are still critiquing this situation. And so part of the consequences, consequences for his action is now that he has to walk that out in a world that's completely against him. And so he needs to choose by faith now that that situation, he needs to say that that's not him anymore, and he needs to, in faith, now walk out that identity in God. He needs to battle through the negative counsel from other people, the negative criticism and so forth. He needs to battle through, and every time he hears something negative, he has to remind himself of who he is in God. How many of us know that that's difficult when all you see in the media is that slap being replayed over and over? I've seen people remixing the slap into songs and stuff like that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's literally what's happening in the, the world. So what, what is he facing? He's facing a world and a society that's constantly reminding him of what he did. And he needs to now choose by faith to say, that was the old me. I'm a new person. And I'm going to have to, by faith, what? Walk out my new identity. So over time, he needs to preach to himself about who he is in God and allow God to take care of what the world's perception of him is about. He can't go around trying to convince people that he's a new person. He needs to just live out that new identity and allow God to do the talking for him if he had a, a relationship with God. Makes sense? And so both him and Chris need to move forward. So when everybody reminds them of what they did and what happened, they need to move forward by faith. And you know what the first person that Will is going to have to forgive is himself. Because sometimes the most difficult person that you and I have a difficult time forgiving is ourselves. How many of us, if we're honest, we beat ourselves more than other people? Like if we talk to ourselves, if... If someone else talked to us the way that we talk to ourselves, we would be like, man, cut that relationship. But sometimes the most toxic person that's talking to us is our inner self. And so for us to move forward, the main person that you and I have to forgive is ourself. And we've got to remind ourselves this. If God forgives me, and if God paid the punishment for my sin upon his son, Jesus then I need to receive that by faith. I don't need to keep beating myself up for something that Christ already died for. Does that make sense? Because some of us, we feel like I got to keep earning that back. No, we receive it by faith. Don't beat yourself up for something that Jesus already died for. He died for your sin. 
And in response to that greatest gift that you and I could ever receive, we say, God, I have my life. You have my life. Whatever you say goes, God. I live my life surrendered to you. Why? Because now I understand what it cost you to give me that free gift. And then we give our lives to God. So we need to move past it. And we got to remind ourselves of the title of this message. Say goodbye to the old me. That's how we move forward in faith. Last point in our notes is this. We need to start living out the new identity in Christ. So we got to stop living based on our old self. And we need to start living out our new identity in Christ. Verse 19 and 20 says this. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. This word ambassador literally means an official representing someone, a higher official. And back in the days, what they would do is for a king to, uh, if a king couldn't make a meeting with another king, they would send an ambassador or an official who would represent the king and literally represent the king in two ways, in their words and in their actions. That's what an ambassador is. And so when God is referencing us, he's saying this, that we become ambassadors of Christ. So in our interactions with people, we are representing Christ in the way that we speak and the way that we act. So now play this forward. When right, you're, right about the time where you're going to get into an argument with someone and you really want to give them the business, you got to remind yourself, I'm an ambassador of Christ and I'm speaking on his behalf. How many of us know if we had that in our mindset, we wouldn't say some of the things that we want to say? I want to let you know. I mean, some of us are like that. Oh, you lucky. I'm an ambassador. But even us just responding that way just says, I can say it, and I want to say it, but I'm not. We're just basically implying that you're lucky. But really what God is saying to us is that we, we, we represent him. Now, imagine if we start to see ourselves that way. We're representing God in our homes. We're representing God at our jobs. We're representing God in our relationships. Man, if we literally seen ourselves as representatives of God, that would change how we act. Why? Because we're not acting on behalf of ourselves. We're representing him. And the biggest gripe that people have against the church is we have, we have bad ambassadors. People, you and I, who are guilty of not representing Christ well. So the biggest knock on the church is a marketing knock. Our God is great. We don't represent him great sometimes. But he is faithful and just to forgive us. And if we walk out in humility, he can even use our mistakes for a purpose. He can use imperfect people. In fact, I heard it says, said it this way. God is great at drawing straight lives, lines with crooked pencils. So when our lives are going wayward, man, God can still draw a straight line. But we got to walk our, our lives in humility and surrender to him. So the best way that we represent Jesus is we need to share about Jesus because the message and the messenger go hand in hand. And the great thing about being a messenger for Christ is this. The more we talk about the message, the more the message transforms us. So the message and the messenger goes hand in hand. The more we talk about Jesus, the more we talk about what he's done in our life, the more we share about him with other people, our lives and our hearts get transformed in the process and we begin to become more like him. So the more we talk about Christ, the more we become like Christ in our lives. So that's why Jesus says this, that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. The more we talk about what he's done for us, the blood represents what he covered through his death and resurrection. The blood covers our sin. And now our testimony is this, what he saved us from. Who that old me that died was, we said, this is the Jesus who gave me a brand new life. That used to be me. We start speaking in past tense. Yeah, I used to be this way, but I'm not that way anymore. I used to act like this. And the more you start to confess what you used to be, the transformation begins to happen. One of the reasons why we don't like to talk about Jesus is because we're still in process. And we don't want to be held accountable 
to the thing, to things that we're saying. So if we're saying, Jesus saved me and that used to be the old me and we still keep living the old way, there's an internal conviction that takes place. That's why none of us like to talk about Jesus, but we need that accountability. The more you start to tell people about what Jesus saved you from, that's accountability to not go back to that lifestyle. We need that in our lives. So Jesus is giving us this wonderful uh, recipe. The message is this, talk about him more, and the more that message will transform you in your life. So we need to talk about Jesus more. Our testimony is so powerful because the more we talk about what he's done, the more we give people an opportunity to experience that, but also we get changed in the process. Ephesians 4.23 says this, Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes, put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So when we get saved, God gives us a brand new wardrobe. Come on, how many of us like new clothes? God literally throws out our old clothes and he gives us brand new clothes. And what the clothes are used for is this. It's to match who we are on the inside. So we got to wear on the outside the clothes that reveals who and what God did for us on the inside. It would make no sense for God to make us new on the inside and we still wear the old self. So what Jesus is reminding us here, wear the new wardrobe so that it matches the new work that I've done for you on the inside. And so how does this happen? The process that this happens is God starts to change our thinking. And one of the ways for us to break free from a sin cycle is to allow God to renew our thoughts. And I have this graphic that I want to put on screen that kind of gives us an idea on how God wants to bring about change. This is literally what is called a sin cycle, where our beliefs and our behaviors and our feelings are working in tangent with one another. And here's the belief. If you and I believe that we're bad, then our behavior would reflect that belief. So what do, what do we start to behave like? We start to behave badly. And then after we do these behaviors that are bad, we start to feel bad for our behavior. And then our feelings now reinforce our beliefs that we are a bad person. And it's this negative sin cycle where our beliefs will influence our behavior and our behaviors will influence our feelings and so forth. And so how God wants to break the sin cycle is this. He wants to intervene by giving us a new belief along with new behaviors. So here's how we break the sin cycle. Put the next graphic up. God first changes our belief. And so now that we are new in God, our new belief is this. I am a new creation. So I have a new belief. I'm a new person in God. That old person has died. We said, we said goodbye to that old person. I'm a new person now in God. That's my belief. And now that I'm a new person, I'm going to act or behave like a new person. So the belief influences my behavior. I start to live new. I start to treat people different. I start to get into the word to understand this new identity that I have in God. And I start to live like Christ. And as I live outwardly what God has done inwardly in my life, I start to feel new. If you're waiting to feel new before you start to act new, you're going to be waiting forever. So we act our way into feeling, and then when we start to act our way into feeling, we feel new, and then that new feeling reinforces that belief that we are new. So we got to know that we're new live like we're new, then we'll feel like we're new, and then we have this new cycle of newness and new identity and new purpose and meaning that God wants to unpack and unfold in our lives. So the root of that is new beliefs. So you know what the enemy is always going to try to do to you? He knows that we're new. He's always going to try to lie to us to make us feel that we're old. So here is what the enemy does. He's going to use lies, that's his weapon, to remind us of who we used to be. And so when the enemy reminds us of our past, we need, we need to remind him of his future. What happens to the enemy? God takes care of him. It's no longer going to exist. God's going to handle that. So what do we need to do in the process? We need to get into God's word and remind ourselves of who we are in God. Why do we sing songs about God? Because God needs to be reminded of who he is? No, we sing songs to remind ourselves of who our God is. Why? Because we forget. We got to remind ourselves. And so the best preaching that we got to do to people is the preaching that we do in the mirror. 
reminding ourselves, no, you are a child of God. You are a new creation. That's the old you. You're not the new person. You're not that old person anymore. You're a new creation. So the more we get into God's word, we confess that over our lives, and that becomes not only a protection against the enemy, but it also becomes the road to our destiny. God will always work on the messenger so that we can deliver his message to the people. Some of us, we've been in church for so long that all we're doing is clocking in and clocking out and you forgot who you are. I'm here to remind you that you're not just a person that takes up a seat in this church. You're a person that God has called to be on mission. Man, God has a story for you. You're not here to just live a comfortable life. You're here to live a life of calling and conviction. It's a life of purpose. And so if you're bored with your life right now, you might not know this God that we serve. Because serving God is not boring. It's never boring. It's also not easy. Okay, let's just get that clear. It's not easy, but it's also not boring. And he's with us every step of the way. Every time I come up to preach, I got to preach to myself. Because the biggest battle that I face literally is the Sunday as I'm driving here to church. And as I'm parking my car, you know what I have to battle in my mind? The thoughts of the enemy saying, you're not worthy to be preaching. Who are you talking to people? If they knew who you really are, or if they knew what I knew about you, you would never, ever be on a stage. And how many of us have had those thoughts before? And I'm guilty of sometimes listening too much to the, the lies of the enemy. And I got to remind myself that I'm not worthy. Yeah, the, the enemy is right. I'm not worthy to be on this stage. Who makes me worthy? Jesus does. And the more I realize my limitations and how God still wants to use me, you know what that creates in me? Worship. God, I'm not worthy, but you make me worthy. Man, I don't deserve all of this, but you give it anyway. Why would you do that? I don't understand you, but it makes me love you more. So the more we understand who God is and what he's calling us to do and what he's done for us in our lives, he literally is breaking down any pride in our lives because we realize that apart from God, you and I are nothing. And that's our new identity. And when you realize that you're nothing, that's when God says, man, they're ready to become something now. I can use that person. Why? Because it's not going to be about them. It's going to be about me. So as we close today and as the worship team comes up, I want to remind us of who we are in God. If Jesus literally changes everything, what does he really change in our lives? And I have on screen a statement that I want you, it'll probably be in your notes too, <clears throat> a statement that you probably have to read over and over to yourself. It's a, I'm not blank because of Christ, I am blank. And we're going to fill in the blanks tonight to remind us of who we are in God. So if Jesus changes everything, what does that mean? I'm not bad because of Christ. I'm forgiven. We're forgiven. That's what Christ done for us. We are forgiven. Jesus changes everything. I'm not broken because of Christ. I am healed. I am healed. God does a great work, man. He does good work with broken pieces. He can put it back together. Give your life to God and he can bring healing. I'm not rejected. Because of Christ, I am loved. I am loved. And the best one is this. I am not dead. Because of Christ, I am alive. The gospel isn't about Jesus making you a better version of you. The gospel is this. That Jesus took you and you died and he resurrected you into a brand new life. So without Christ, you and I are dead. But because of Christ, now we have a life alive with meaning and purpose. Jesus cancels our past, gives us a brand new future. And our proper response to that is worship.